Good evening. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you all at today's webinar, which is the first one for this session. I'm really happy to do this honor, and I welcome Dr. Nandulalis, our resource person for today, who accepts the invitation with wholeheartedly. So I also welcome our deputy CEO, Engineer Gunawadana, and council members, Engineer Niyas, Engineer Manjul Samar Singh, and our ex honorary secretary, and members who are physically here attending this same webinar, and those who are attending online, I welcome everyone for this webinar today. Before commencing the today's event, I just let me brief you about the civil engineering sectional committee, main activities, what we are planning to do. We will be conducting technical presentations and non-technical presentations on Tuesdays and most probably on Thursdays. And there may be changes with these days, but Wednesdays we have kept for non-technical presentations, technical presentations on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Apart from this, we will organize a field visits, including technical, uh, technical things, tours, CSR programs, CPDs, and we are looking at this techno at the annual session thing. And I request you all to come with appropriate topics with suitable resource persons to handle this year events. I suggest all of you to be with us and share whatever the things we are doing in this year and up, update ourselves and do the honor to the country. Let me come to the today's event organized by our civil engineer sectional committee under the title Design and Construction of Post-Tension Box Girder Bridges Holistic Approach. This presentation focuses on giving a holistic view of the design and construction process of bridges. I state few words that how our resource person look at it. He says, a bridge is not a piece of abstract art. It is a structure which has to satisfy a need, get built and be durable, maintainable and should be economical. And the design has to start with this in mind. It's very beautifully said, and it's actually it's very acceptable. In this presentation, Dr. Nandun will give you an insight view of this process with some of the key design and construction challenges of post tension in concrete bridges. Hoping that these ideas will be of use in developing the bridge sector in Sri Lanka. With this enormous knowledge on this sector, I hope Dr. Nandu will accept to conduct a series of lectures under this topic in another platform at a later date. That will benefit our members who are, who are actually seeking their upliftment, upliftments on their ladder in these professional careers. So knowledge of developing the designing and construction of which Sri Lanka can be updated, uplifted with, from this type of seminars, webinars. So thank you, Dr. Nando. I'm definite that this would be a very impressive and effective webinar for you as the civil engineers and most probably all of you are from the industry. So to do this instigating not about our resource person, Though he's a non person, a non person to us, I invite Indika Band Indira Banduka, coordinator of the technical sessions, who is sharing this knowledge sharing sessions, to proceed the event with an instigating note to introduce our resource person. Over to you, Banduka. Thank you. Today, our speaker, Dr. Nadun Alis, is a graduate from the University of Molotov with a first class degree and title as the best civil engineering graduate for the academic year 1998. 
and he received the UNESCO team award, gold medalist for his academic achievement and won the full, full scholarship to read his PhD at Cambridge University, UK. He published many papers and presented his work at conferences and won awards for his research. And Dr. Nadun is a chartered civil engineer, majored structural engineering and having more than 22 long years of wide ranging experience in highways, transportation, oil and gas, offshoring, building and tunneling sectors, and has built a strong technical reputation in delivering high profile complex projects across the globe. He has been working for multidisciplinary companies under different capacities, principal bridge engineer, team leader, and many more gaining valuable hands-on experience and in-depth sector knowledge. Dr. Nadun has, has led a variety of major highway projects covering all phases like feasibility studies, design, construction, and maintenance across the globe with a variety of bridges, wired structures for highways, rail, and light railway projects. In 2017, he migrated to Sri Lanka and has been working as a senior deputy general manager at Marga Engineering Private Limited for nearly two years. He has recently completed his assignment as the international structural consultant for the Central Expressway Project Section 1. And Dr. Nadun is an experienced business and project leader who is responsible for managing key clients and varieties of projects. He's a fellow of this institution of Civil Engineers UK, member of this institution of engineers Sri Lanka, and also a member of the Society of Structural Engineers Sri Lanka. And over to you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, I should thank uh, Engineer Mrs. Uh, Kamala Gawadwar for inviting me and uh, asking me to come and uh, do a presentation. And uh, also, some time back, actually, uh, Professor Jaising also uh, asked me to come, but at that time, I was really busy uh, of uh, my assignment. So I said that uh, when I get an opportunity, I come and talk. So. Uh, when, he, uh, when, when, when the invitation came, I was thinking, uh, what should I be uh, uh, presenting today, in, uh, which is, in a way, uh, just want to give a message uh, to our young engineers and those who are working in the industry. And uh, then after a lot of thought, I thought uh, I would touch base on that uh, design and construction of uh, post-tension square bridges and just the holistic approach. Because I just want to talk about the, the overall process which involves the, the design, right? And I'm not getting into detail of the design itself, but this the process is the one that I wanted to highlight. Because, uh, you know, we are going through unprecedented time in Sri Lanka context, and I know many engineers uh, wanted to go abroad uh, for employment, but what's out there? And, uh, but I thought, because I've been away for about 18 years in UK and while working in Sri Lanka, I see that certain gaps. Maybe that while sharing this, uh, some of my ideas may be useful for you to get engaged with when you go abroad and also practice in Sri Lanka too. So on that note, uh, it's uh, just, just bear with me if I may. Jesus. Moving. Ah. Thank you. Sorry for the site, uh, site uh, technical glitch, but uh, nonetheless, now we carry on this one. So uh, uh, my presentation all would be like, uh, uh, I would touch base on the, the introduction to bridges and predominantly I'm going to talk about this design process as I mentioned to you, and also uh, some of the design and construction challenges of uh, concrete box girder post-tension bridges. Also wrap up with some uh, thoughts. When you look at that uh, types of bridges, of course, uh, you see variety. I mean, uh, when you walk around the city and uh, there are so many types, 
But what I want to emphasize is none is possible without the understanding of the materials. So if you look at the history, I mean, uh, uh, if you look at the overall uh, type of materials, we have wood, bricks, concrete, and steel. And the beauty is the composite cell as well. The understanding of this uh, material, push the boundaries, and then development of the technology and et cetera. And this gives the open up uh, many, many opportunities for uh, engineers to come up with uh, fascinating structures, uh, marvelous bridges, right? On that note, uh, I would like to share a few uh, bridges. This is uh, one in Cambridge. If you happen to be in Cambridge, uh, definitely you will not miss this one. Uh, because when I studied there, that uh, uh, in the, Cambridge itself is a village that uh, there are so many uh, 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 colleges around and it's a, we call a river camp. And uh, underneath the river camp, I mean, people do what you call the punting. You go on a boat and then uh, you use a stick and push against the riverbed. And then the summertime is fascinating and the people actually enjoy themselves there. So you will definitely go under this bridge. What I see with this bridge is, uh, uh, as I showed in the picture below, uh, is a uh, the, the bridge itself has lots of compressive struts, which uh, that's how it works. It's, uh, uh, but there's a myth actually, it's been uh, saying that it's been done by, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's actually a Newton's bridge. It's not the case. We call it a Cambridge Mathematical Bridge. This has been uh, rebuilt a number of times, but it's uh, standing right now. So don't miss it when you happen to visit that site. And um, recently, actually, I noted this one from uh, the BBC documentary, which uh, is uh, in Karov Bridge. Uh, it's what fascinated me is that uh, this is being done every year. And they use uh, some kind of straw woven by hand, and the people get together that area, and then they build this bridge. And uh, the uh, it's been about you know this this has been practiced about six hundred years. So if you look at the context of the technology, they would have known that it's not been documented. But with the experience, they know how to build a bridge. People walk across at the end of the day, and they they've been using that. <clears throat> now this one is in uh, Scotland, right? If you happen to be UK again, north side of uh, uh, UK. And uh, it's a beautiful bridge uh, built in 1890. Uh, what fascinated about this structure is, if you look at that time, they haven't had that uh, the computer analysis uh, or computer modeling available, but they use the fundamentals. There was an article, it says that uh, that time, when they came up with this idea, they want to demonstrate that it works. So that's the three engineers got together and they showed that uh, how the load path actually distributed and uh, 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 showing that the bridge is stable. And uh, what I wanted to emphasize here is uh, that if you are a young engineer or, or a professional, but you need to understand the, the fundamentals. That is a key aspect. If you know the fundamentals with the tech available technology, you can use any software. That is a matter of understanding the software. But if you don't know the the fundamental, then you'll be in trouble. Because uh, there's a misconception saying that people know how to use the software, they think they're the uh, engineers. Apparently, unfortunately, that's not the case because you need to know uh, what to look for, how the structure works and etc. right? And as I said that uh, the when it comes to uh, recent developments, uh, people get to know about the, the uh, advancement of the material, like of uh, high strength concrete and uh, 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 pre stressing tendons and uh, uh, proper anchorages and constructions, uh, like for example, the crane capability. The more you get uh, advancement in the industry, people tend to push boundaries. That's what happens. You get launch span bridges, very high uh, bridges. One, the picture below is, uh, we call the Milan Wider in France. It's a fascinating structure on a, on a uh, uh, the uh, cloudy day. It's, you're like, you're flying through that uh, clouds, right? How, how people achieve that? It's, it's because of uh, understanding of uh, this technology. I wanted to show you this picture. This has been done as part of the Millennium Celebration in UK. 
uh, this is about uh, 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 the county council of that uh, area. They want to come up, with, they want to have a bridge because the requirement is such that uh, it's needed for uh, the uh, people to cross over the, the bridge as well as you need to facilitate the navigation. And how they came up, they opened up that for a uh, architectural competition, right? All the architects got together and it was a competition and they won by that process. Then only they went with the, the design of that bridge. So this is a good example of how the architects and the engineers can collaborate and come up with a fascinating structure. Okay, now that's actually what we see in there, but let's have a uh, a bit of a look at like what's happening in Sri Lanka context. And in Sri Lanka, of course, uh, we have a proud history of uh, bridges. Probably you would have seen that uh, stone bridge in Anuradhapura, you know, built in, uh, not to be built in 1000, uh, around 1080. If you look at that structure carefully, it's very similar to what you see in the Central Expressway as well. You see that uh, uh, two, two columns and a capping beam and a beams. So, that's what it says here. People knew that. People knew that that time. Unfortunately, it's not documented, but we had a, a proud history about that. Then up on the right-hand side, uh, I, I have to mention about that Nine Arm Bridge. That's one of the famous bridges. And that uh, the, it's been built by the, the British. Uh, and uh, how they got that idea, if you happen to be in UK, if you drive around that, you see many arc bridges. That, that, is, that concept is there, right? Um, so what about uh, the recent, recent structures, what you see in Sri Lanka? Yes, thankfully, things are coming now to Sri Lankan context. We are blessed to have wonderful, wonderful structure across the new calendar. We call this extra Dross Bridge, right? Fascinating structure. And then, uh, uh, obviously, uh, next to the structure, there's another element which is called the it's a steel bridge. I talk about this one a little bit later in the presentation. But what I want to emphasize is uh, the these are coming now to Sri Lanka. My question to you is that uh, yes, we are getting it's been built. Do you know are we following the right procedure? Do we have the right experience to undertake these bridges for Sri Lankans? Do we have a knowledge gap? These are the things you should ask yourself, right? I'm sure that by talking to people involved and that's uh, companies, that uh, foreign companies, actually uh, they come and help us. And uh, to a certain degree, of course, we have talented engineers. They are going through this process and understanding. That, that is good. Knowledge transfer is happening now. It's good to know that. But this is the crunch of my uh, presentation today. So if you have these bridges, are we, what I wanted to emphasize is, what is the procedure we should follow to achieve these things? So on that note, let's follow on my presentation a little bit further. So as I mentioned, this is uh, uh, the process that I wanted to uh, emphasize a uh, little bit more. Let's look at this picture. What you see is that, uh, a study being done, there was a requirement such that they want to come up with a bridge structure across this river. If you look at, there are a number of options are available. So many options are available. So how do you go by? How do you select the bridge which is suits for the site conditions, which is uh, 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 functional and economical structure? What is the procedure you should do? Just I want to pause a little bit and think about yourself, like what you should be doing. So to me, the way I look at this, it's a is iterative process, right? And uh, good good bridge design is a holistic response to the site. It wouldn't come all of a sudden, right? So you need to follow these procedures. Now start from the beginning, right? Uh, you can say top one, uh, you need to gather facts. There may be technical constraints, historic constraints, requirements. It can be political or, his or historical, right? Then you go to the next 
uh, box, which is you need to go and look at that root sensitivity, uh, function of the bridge, what material do you choose, what method of construction you should adapt, and things like that. Then you come to the next stage, which is called the uh, explore options, which I will talk about a little bit in detail, but this is where we get the value engineering and et cetera. Then you have a bunch of team, which have designers, architects, contractors, stakeholders. What I want to tell you is this being practiced in developing countries, developed countries, I would say the UK. Each and every point is going through. Right? And uh, don't think that you go one cycle would give the answer. No. You need to do a number of cycles and to understand the requirement. When you know the question, when you know the requirements, what to do, then only you can proceed. This is what I feel. And uh, uh, We'll talk about this concept a little bit more with certain examples. Then you get these ideas into your head, right? Now, if you work in a, a design company, or it can be building, or it can be bridges, or anywhere, but basically, the, uh, the broadly, you can categorize into five areas, which is, as i uh, shown here, uh, brief, brief assembly, or, or call the feasible study, option identification, option selection, design in detail, and construction and maintenance, right? So these are the fundamentally, the broader sense you see that. Why this is important is because uh, if you don't uh, follow this uh, procedure as I shown here, there may be so much repercussions. For example, this is what we call the cost of change. Now, on the, the x-axis, you see feasibility, concept, detail, construction. But the penalty you would get if you want to do a change at the last stages, it's huge. So why don't you spend more time on that uh, feasibility and concept? This is what we should be doing. I give an example that, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I've been working in the offshore sector as well. Offshore engineering, and you get very harsh environments. Uh, you see the the wind farms and uh, some of the oil and gas platforms installed in the the seabed, right? You know that uh, uh, installation cost is humongous, right? You need to pay, spend about uh, half a million US dollars or one million US dollars a day for a vessel. It depends on the vessel. If you do that kind of things, and the, you know you develop something, you go and try to install it. What would happen if something goes wrong? Repercussions would be huge. So I, I think uh, this is what I want to encourage even Sri, Sri Lankan context. We should put more effort in the feasibility and concept stage and do the right thing. And then you come up with the, the best answer a little bit later. Now, uh, what do you look into this feasibility stage? Yeah, some of the consideration, but uh, I think it's difficult to write up a definitive uh, uh, list, but just to start up with that, there are certain areas I would say that you should be looking into as you see from this slide. But we will go through a uh, little bit uh, uh, in detail discussing each and every aspects, okay? This, uh... now, as I emphasized to you that uh, the feasibility and concept design is a very important stage of any, any design you are going to undertake. Because uh, uh, the, the, when, when you spend a little bit more time on it, uh, you, you would understand the client objectives, requirements, and the constraints. That will allow, enable you to come up with a good uh, structure which is suitable for the location. Right, and uh, uh, I think uh, personal view is that uh, experience is also very important because uh, sometimes uh, you should understand the sizing, whether that structure works, and it, so it comes with the experience as well. Right, uh, it, it's. Um, I tell you why why this is uh, important. Uh, no, uh, yeah, here also I said like in a vital phase, most difficult in design, design or originate from all sites at concept stage. I don't know whether you probably encounter these uh, scenarios in your lifetime and what you do, right? Now, uh, 
you should be also looking into uh, uh, buildability and uh, constructability aspects as well when you at this stage. I wanted to tell you like, you know, why this uh, experience matters. This, this is something I observed. Now, for example, that of course, after my graduation, I went abroad and did my higher studies. And then uh, all my life I've been in the industry. When I first joined the company in UK, right? You know, they took me as a graduate. Although I have that uh, high qualification, qualification would not count at all. The experience counts. That's what it matters there. So I had to learn hardcore, hands-on experience. Then only you get the confidence and then only you get, get into uh, some decision making. So uh, especially when you, uh, you, hopefully you get an opportunity when you go abroad or here, but when this feasible and concept stage is very important that you have to have that hands-on experience. Then only you come up with the best solution there. This is my personal view and my personal experience. And then, uh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do right now is, yeah, we went through that, uh, the process, that high level process. Of course, we'll take an example and uh, explore this a little bit more, right? Now, this is a Central Expressway project. I'm sure that uh, you uh, you know, uh, most of you know about it. We have a few phases, phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase two is Mirigam to Kunagala, which is operational. And uh, of course, if you want to travel, you can see it's a nice structure. Built by all the local contractors. And then when I was working for Marga, I was uh, supporting the uh, design team in section D. Most of the structures actually been built in Kunagala that uh, my team, uh, uh, I was the team leader and headed by some of the other uh, engineers. We did it, so which is very good. So that confidence is there. Then I got the opportunity to move on to uh, phase one, which is I was a structural consultant, and it's a big project. And again, uh, there are quite a lot of uh, uh, structures are, are there. Fifteen kilometers of viaducts. It includes uh, viaducts, bridges, overpasses, underpasses, everything. Right. Uh, I'm not going to talk about in detail those things, but I wanted to tell you that uh, how this process works with a certain aspect of that project. That's what my objective is today. Now, what is the objective here? Of course, any, any, uh, any phrase that uh, you'd have come across, is not a straightforward line, right? It, it needs to go through certain uh, bends and et cetera, depending on the, the EIA and then uh, other requirements. And that particular location, the, the main phrase, process the railway at an angle. It's not, I mean, perfect scenario would be that uh, the main phrase should cross the, the railway perpendicular. Then it, you can come up with a nice bridge, easy bridge. But here it crosses at an angle. Now this problem presented to us. Now, how you come up with the proper bridge design here? How you find the uh, good structure response to the site? Let me go through with you some of the things that uh, how we address that. Now, uh, in a the schematic point of view, this is in nutshell what you see. Uh, uh, the blue one is the, the central expressway line. The other one is a box that I put it in a schematic manner. It's the railway line, so you need to cross. And then we have a skew span, which you need to tackle through, right? In fact, that this uh, uh, issue is happening at three locations, uh, but don't worry about that too much on the details, but the, think about the context here, that we need to come up with a structure suitable for this location, right? How do you go? First thing, as I said, like you now, feasible study, data gathering. You must do that. You need desktop study. Obviously, you need to go to site and see whether, what are the conditions? So my, by myself and the people who work under me, so we all went there and then with the contract, of course, and see the investigator at the site, whether what are the constraints, just to get a feel of the site, okay? And then uh, uh, you start talking to the stakeholder, which I come back to in a minute. The important thing of this exercise is identify the requirements, technical, commercial, and time. Reason I mentioned that, you cannot do research here. When you work in the in industry, you are not allowed to do research, you need uh, it's time, time bound and uh, the commercial constraints are there. So that's one of the things. And important aspects are the key documents. Now, uh, this is what we say in the youngsters when you go to uh, uh, their training, you should read this, how, how you contractually operate. 
So this is done by underfeeding and it's a design and build contract. How the payment mechanism works because you are wearing which hat? Are you wearing the client hat? Are you wearing the contractor hat? Are you wearing, I represent the, uh, the engineer? These are things you should know, how we operate, what context and uh, how, how you put the pressure. And except, but that ultimate goal for us should be, we want the best bridge, we want the right thing, right? And uh, uh, so please go through this uh, uh, tender documents, preliminary drawings, codes, and etc. So that's the starting point. And then I mentioned to you, if, uh, the, there are a number of stakeholders, any projects you get involved. So in this instance, that uh, the, we had to deal with uh, uh, rail authority, and uh, uh, we have so many discussions. I um, I cut it short, but I come to the point in a minute. And then uh, uh, anyway, the stakeholder environment is also difficult to uh, generalize, but it depends on the location. It depends on the client's requirements. So we had a discussion with the, the railway, but we realized that uh, the geometrical constraints point of view, we have two existing lines, but part of this uh, Columbus Suburban Railway project, they want additional lines. So the, the geometrical requirements changed. That's the starting point, right? And uh, 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 we need to provide provisions for these lines being done for the electrification. So then they have uh, set out certain parameters. Let me summarize that quickly. Horizontally, as you see that uh, you have existing lines and then you have new lines, then the parameters are different. That's one of the geometrical requirements we have to abide by. Vertically, of course, because the, the trains will be electrification lines and then there's a certain height requirement. So we have to be, uh, uh, go with 6.6 .6 clearance. What important thing is they have vehemently denied to have any peers within the railway boundary. So no peers, you cannot have single peer within that. It's ruled out, right? So what we ended up with that then the there are these are the, the design requirements we ended up with. The requirement as such as I said, told you that there are four locations, VD4, VD919, but uh, the, I'm going to talk about that uh, VD4, VD19. As you see, just want to highlight one point. The clear span is about 70 meters, right? That's just think about that. And then uh, because it's in a curve and uh, you need to provide the provision for future widening and you need to provide that uh, clearance requirements, horizontal and vertical, and also high flood level. And as I mentioned, no peers within the railway bar. So you, uh, you ended up with many challenges. How will you come up with the structure to suit for these conditions? Now, uh, this actually takes me to a little bit further about option identification. This is where I've been talking about it. Uh, before that, uh, I thought I just wanted to summarize what is the difference between pretension and postage just for your, I know that you've done that many times in the, University, but uh, just nonetheless, that uh, this is what we say you stretch it, you uh, cast it, and then cut the, the, uh, the tendons. You uh, put the pressure back into the, uh, the system, which enhances you to materialize, you know, uh, getting greater spans. That is actually pre, pre tension. And then there are a number of beams, I beams, U beams, and there are so many, right? In the industry, you will be able to find. What is Post tension. Post tension has the uh, the the uh, the the options for the designers to lay the, the profile, the tendon, the way you want it, right? Because as you see the, if you look at the bendy movement diagram, then you can lay the the uh, uh, your cables along that line so that you can uh, get more benefit. I think the beauty is that. Uh, the post tension or pre tension because of understanding or in advancement of that uh, uh, high strength concrete as well as the uh, high strength tendons that actually give us to have these bridges, right? We'll come back to it a little bit later. Now, I, I told you, like, one, one thing you remember that 70 meter span, right? Now, uh, this is called the option identification, bridge types, or economical span. I, I find this uh, slide very fascinating, mainly because that uh, 
um, as you see from here, uh, you have certain spans. And for a certain span, you have certain structures suitable. Now, if you look at the reinforced concrete slabs, they, that is economical up to 25 meters. I mean, if you go for a little bit long, more, it will be heavy structures. That's not the, what we want, right? And there's another one I would go neck to neck is the, the span to depth ratio. Now, for example, if you look still with the uh, reinforced concrete, now typical uh, span to depth ratio is 17. Now, what you have is here, here uh, let's say uh, 25, right? And then you will be able to work out what is the depth you need for that particular span. So by looking at this one, I would say that we ended up with, uh, for that 17 meter span, we ended up with post tension box, concrete box girders, steel, and steel composites. But of course, we are not going for the cable supported suspension because it's way above and it's catered for a different spans, right? So straight away, without doing anything, you get an idea what kind of structure is suitable for this location, don't you? And uh, also, if you are uh, doing that primitive uh, design, and uh, this is, uh, there are so many documentation available. Like, for example, these are pre-tension concrete uh, beams. And uh, the beauty here is uh, 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 U1, U2, U12. There are a number of sizes of the bridge, uh, the, the beams, sorry. And then color coding says the spacing of the, uh, the, the beams. And that chart gives what are the good spans the beam can take up. I mean, of course, there are companies, CELS and uh, state SD and CC, and they develop that I beams and et cetera, but there are also some charts. So these are very good thing. And then uh, I, I would say that uh, if your company is, uh, we have company procedures and uh, company IPs, they have uh, databases. You can refer to their databases and see that, uh, uh, similar structures and get a good idea about that uh, 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 the, the uh, suitable spans as well, right? Now, uh, <clears throat> having known that, like uh, three things uh, I would do is that uh, uh, can I get an appreciation of what's happening around? I mean, in Sri Lanka, we have Kadavati Interchange, Port Access, uh, Port City, I mean, LRT is coming up and New Canada Bridge. And of course, you can refer to these projects and see the, the sizes and et cetera. You get a feel of it, right? And as I mentioned to you, that hands-on experience is vital at this stage. And then uh, the important message I want to give you is ECI, early contractor involvement. What, what, what is it that? I mean, it's a design and build project. That is the beauty of uh, having this ECI because you get the opportunity to talk to the, the, the contractor. You identify their uh, technology, you identify their uh, capability and uh, uh, the speed of contract, everything you can talk to them. And for example, then I work for a project in UK, which is uh, M25, it's a big motorway project, it's a widening project. So the Atkins, the company I work is the designer and then the contractor was Balfour Beatty and Stunts. Uh, there are, there's a huge cost penalty if you don't do it right. Like uh, especially the, the time constraints is very tough because if you uh, slip off, off that target, uh, this is one of the busiest road, uh, 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 motorways in UK and uh, the highway agency equivalent to RDA, they put actually huge penalties. So they wanted to finish this in time. Then the idea was we had to sit down with the contractor and come up with this, uh, uh, the cost effective, efficient, constructible structures. So that had happened. So I would say, and if you are working on a design and build contract, and especially if you, in this instance, the MCC was the, the contractor, we had the opportunity to talk to them and I identify the uh, uh, number of op options. And there you have other areas, like I touch upon a little bit later, this uh, bearing uh, expansion choice, because you should know that right up front, then the changes to the structure would be fairly minimum, right? And why you want to have ECI? Because it gives the opportunity to save time, mitigate risk, and uh, uh, it's a joint up effort at the end of the day. That's what I feel. So uh, having talked about these things, so we came up with these three options, right? So post-tension concrete box girders, 
steer composite option. And then there's another option which I talk to you in a minute. And uh, based on these facts, the post tension concrete box is uh, now people you've have, you've seen that is happening here, and it's it's, it's clearly uh, for I mean very standard structure put it in a way, but it's uh, you, if you handle it very carefully. This is one of the projects I worked in uh, when I was in uh, UK. It's it's for Aberdeen Channel across the uh, Hong Kong Channel. It's about main span was 115. You see that the uh, the middle the depth is shallower than when you come to the, the piers is higher, mainly because as I mentioned to you, if you can remember that two slides, that is the span to the ratio and the economic span. Based on that, you'll be able to work out but without doing any calculation, what would be the right parameters. You get an understanding about that. So we thought, okay, that structure suits here well because here the green line shows the boundary because you can't put any piers in between. The piers are outside, hence, the box where the post tension was an option. Then, uh, as you see, it's another picture of that. Uh, the red one is the clear boundary, the railway requirements, vertical and the horizontal. And uh, as you see, it's not a perfect curve, but I come back to it because there was tight constraints of the height. And otherwise, you need to raise the profile, which has a, another economic uh, disadvantage. It, uh, it needs land acquisitions and it could have so many repercussions. So we have to deal with this uh, available height, what we've given, right? Steel composite options, yes. Uh, um, this is very famous in UK and uh, you have uh, steel girders, uh, ladder structures, and very efficient and uh, primarily because uh, the, the, uh, the installation is very quick, uh, to be honest with you, that uh, there are, uh, heavy cranes are available, then you can use it. And uh, But again, remember that the slide I mentioned to you, you will be able to work it out, what would be the economic uh, sizes and et cetera. Um, and with this one, uh, one of the things you should also consider is the uh, durability aspects, the painting systems, the regular inspection that is also required in order to come up with that. Do we have that system in place here? That's a question that you have to ask yourself. And uh, how the maintenance system is uh, developing in Sri Lankan context? Are they rigid enough? And otherwise, it's like a, your, your car. If you maintain your car, then you have a long life. Otherwise, it will rust and it will go. Right? That These are the stuff you remember. The, when it comes to steel composites, and uh, yes, we have a number of types. One is the uh, closed steel composites and open composite, which is a classical one which you see in uh, many European countries, right? The good thing about that one is it has a very torsional resistance rather than the other one. Of course, the eye ladders are also good, but then you have had lots of braces throughout the time, uh, line and intervals would be varied. But whereas for this one, which is good, but uh, I think uh, there are key areas you need to satisfy, which is the the uh, plate uh, uh, plate bending. I mean, things uh, buckling, of course, uh, lateral torsion bucklings all needs to satisfy. That's what you have a number of stiffness inside this box. Uh, for for example, then I had a look at uh, the what's happening in the new Calanay Bridge. There was a span. If you just pass across the the uh, baseline, there's a crossing, which uh, the, the span is 78 meters, right? And uh, the uh, the box itself, where the height varied from 2 to 2.9, uh, the middle one, 2. And I thought, yeah, this is a suitable option. And while talking to our, the contractor, they also proposed something on your right, which is a single box, right? So we had, we had lots of discussion about this. And I'm just stating uh, uh, very quickly, but uh, there are so many discussions and understanding the pros and cons of these uh, the arrangements. Uh, these are some of the pictures uh, I took when I was, uh, I had a, thankfully I had an opportunity to go and visit the site and uh, this, uh, the new calendar bridge. You see a certain number of uh, 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 the stiffnesses are there. Yeah, because the stiffnesses are required for, in order to prevent that uh, plate buckling. Right, and also uh, the workmanship is very important, uh, especially when it comes to detailing, detailing, uh, and also in the uh, contractual stage, you need to put a lot of effort for 
monitoring this uh, uh, the workmanship because uh, there are a lot of building are there. So you need to provide high provisions, uh, high MPAs, MPIs should be the status and et cetera. So that's only then you get the right product and also the painting system. So certain areas you need to think about when you come up with the steel structures, right? But uh, when the standards are there, when the specs are there, maintenance regulations are there, it's easy. That's what the UK are there. It's like a bread and butter for them. There are so many structures in steel. We can actually uh, do the similar thing here if the, the process is there, right? And uh, this is one uh, few pictures uh, why, because I'm passing every day when I go to the CEP uh, through the bridge and I was fascinated to see day by day the progress. I took some pictures. So this is one of them, as you see. Uh, so I thought, why not? We can think about a similar one here too, because as I showed here, we have a certain requirement, 70 meter span, but we can come up with a nice two or three boxes. That is an option. Right, so there's lots of thought process went in to think about an option here. Right, so this was an option. Then the last option I want to say this is uh, I got this idea because when I was uh, driving through in uh, Cambridge, uh, there's a town called Girton, and uh, the one circle is sourced two two lines crosses each other at an angle. We have a very similar situation, of course, uh, not two uh, bridges, sorry, uh, two roadways. One is a uh, uh, railway line, our case, and the other one is the bridge, right? So uh, what they've done is, um, is uh, uh, they came up with this I-guard arrangement. Uh, it's not a perfect, uh, uh, I would say, uh, some part of the bridge would not be utilized, as you can see here, uh, this uh, <clears throat> 3D, view of that, uh, the concept being developed. Uh, this, this is the central exhaust spray going through underneath the railway. The picture below shows how you stack the girders. The girders are not towards the direction of the traffic, but it's kept perpendicular. Mainly we want to satisfy the, the clearance requirement as you see in this picture. That's, that's considered to be an option, but uh, uh, is technically feasible. Aesthetically, you have can argue a few things, but uh, commercially also, I don't want to quote on these things, but we, you need to think about these things. Right. Uh, then and all, like uh, you saw that three options, and then uh, uh, with, while discussing the contract and other all the stakeholders, it came that uh, post-tensioning uh, uh, a concrete box girder probably be the good option kind of right at this stage so we were we wanted to explore a little bit more about uh, that uh, concept and the one of the important things for post tension uh, box girders is the construction this is what i want to take you to the the next part of the presentation where um, the erection methods because the analysis changes with the the uh, type of construction now, uh, predominantly, that we can broadly categorize that uh, the post tension box girders are balanced cantilever methods, incremental launching method, and also full staging. I I'll discuss this in a minute, right? So these are the very high level aspects. Now let's talk about uh, the balance cantilever. Here, <clears throat> if you happen to pass uh, the uh, New Calony, you would have seen that uh, the bridge being done in this fashion, the balance. Of course, there were cables. If you just forget about the cables, that's the idea. And uh, what, what, what it says here is that each and every stage, you have to do the pre-tension, post-tension. That's how you stitch it up. And uh, sizes may be vary two to four meters, and uh, it all depends on the, the crane capacity. And uh, what I want to emphasize is large number of uh, cables are there uh, and tenders needs to be terminated at certain locations. These are the key, key aspects of the box, right? But analysis is complex, mainly because uh, the long-term uh, effects, creep and shrinkage and temperature and things like that, because it moves, as you move, you get the cantilever and it deflects. 
So finally, when you do that stitch at the middle, you want to have a perfect balance. So that's why the, the analysis is very rigorous. You have to make sure that is a proper match. Otherwise, you get a displacement. And uh, uh, the, oh, I mean, we have uh, sophisticated software that uh, we can handle it. And uh, that's not an issue if you play, play it well, right? So let's have a look on the balance cantilever again. Uh, and then as I mentioned to you, uh, there are two types. What is called the cast in situ. Cast in situ may be useful, especially when you process the rivers, because you don't, uh, you can't have former underneath, right? And then uh, the uh, former itself form the next stage, and you cannot go wrong. And why? Once you do the first stage, here you have to do the the stitching. By the way, you won't be able to see uh, the tensioning inside. People can walk inside. The box is such that big. People and the operations, the tendon operations will be inside the box, right? The other one is what you call the segmental operations. Now, this is what you see at many places, even in Sri Lanka, thankfully. And uh, 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 you, you construct it. And there are two ways you can bring that piece. One is a mobile crane. It depends on the size, as I mentioned to you, and the location. Or if it is on a river, still you do that, you can use the barges to bring up and then you can raise it up. That is also feasible. The important thing I wanted to tell you is that uh, these segmental construction, that uh, these pieces are stitching together. You have to have a female and male joint. They are stitched. That uh, the, uh, the picture at the bottom at the left is that what it shows you, the, uh, the shear keys, which transfer the shear. And say the structure is straight, then you'll be able to uh, have a precast segment without an issue. But if the structure in a curve, it's very difficult. So we do call what you call the match casting. The formwork itself can be adjusted to suit for the next cast. And uh, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, that, that, is, that is the way people use. And how they stitch, you use the epoxy and then you uh, get it into the pieces and do the post tension, right? And the other one, as you see in the right hand picture, is using the gantries. Gantry also a uh, possibility of using. Now, what do you mean by incremental load measured? Now, uh, uh, these are some of the pictures that I took it from the internet, and this is from the port access city. By the way, if you want to see that uh, I visited a few uh, days back, you can walk around, uh, not in the port city itself, but uh, you drive around. You'll be able to see these scantries are there. I really encourage uh, if you are interested, go and have a look. And uh, what it says is use the gantry, you lift it up, and then you get the post tension. And then finally, uh, use the post tension. Then uh, the other option is the full stage. Rather than worry about this uh, stitching together, you do a simple thing you do a foam work and you do ca cast, the, cast the box itself on top of it and do the post tension. Here, the analysis is going to be changed because you'll be able to get the, the longer cables throughout. The analysis will be simpler than the other one because you don't want to worry about this, uh, 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 the changes of the deflection of when you go to segment construction, right? So that's one, of, one area, just excuse me. Okay, <clears throat> how many minutes I have? Okay, yeah. yeah right. So get into, uh, still I'm talking about these considerations, articulation. What do you mean by articulation? That is also a very important aspect of a bridge, en a bridge engineering. Now, uh, if the bridge is constructed and uh, uh, due to creep and shrinkage and temperature, temperature increment or decrease or differential uh, temperature, the, it will move, it will move, right? How you facilitate that movement? If you have a quarter frame structure, if everything is fixed, what would happen? If you would not allow that movement to take place, you get high concentration. And then it will be an economic solution because the ma massive forces will come onto the, the substructure to the, the piers, and finally to the uh, piles. 
So you have to provide what you call these things, bearings, right? Which is very important aspects because don't think these are a piece of rubber because I talked to a engineer and the full name, but say, why are you worrying about? You just, it's a piece of rubber. But that's not the case because rubber itself has that, uh, the elastomeric bearing, the one at the right, it has certain steel plates inside. There's a certain way of designing because you need to facilitate that movement, right? The size, everything matters, how you do. What happens if you don't provide it? Have you gone to one of uh, the very old bridges under the concrete bridges? Did you see some cracks on the, the uh, abutments? Why? Because the, this is not functioning well. The forces are getting to the button, which is not good. And then you start uh, developing this crack. So uh, it's up to the designer to make sure the structure is stable. You need to find out which location you have to make it fixed, which location you have to make it uh, movable. If it is a curved bridge, this challenge is still there, but you have to make sure you identify right bearing at right location. The one at the top is the, the one is we call the spherical bearing because it provides a six degrees of freedom, which is really good. You can have a number of ways. You can have movements, rotation, and things like that, right? Uh, so please bear in your mind that uh, this is an important aspect. Then <clears throat> option identification comes to expansion joint. I, I told you, that uh, uh, the, the length of the bridge is very important because the larger the length, the larger the movement. Now, if you go in the Central Expressway or the outer circular, you see that certain intervals you have this uh, expansion joints. In Sri Lanka, I think most of the, the, the expressway systems, either we use uh, the strip seas or this, uh, 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 rubber type of uh, expansion joint, right? Now, one picture that I want to show you, the top one, uh, the say your span is like about 150, 160, something like that, then you have to have modular joints. You have to have number of them because otherwise you cannot cater for that movement, right? That is also a decision you have to take while doing the design. Okay, right. Let's touch upon these areas very quickly. Now, uh, if you are a designer, you please take, take care of that health and safety. When uh, I would say that about, few, uh, about 15, 20 years back, uh, uh, yeah, health and safety was there. But now, while seeing what's happening in Sri Lankan context, actually it's improved, I have to admit. But there are so many things you can improve as well. Like, uh, I don't know how many people telling the truth, like if you look at the biggest big scale projects, but I heard that still there are certain fair details occurring. So no, now my question to you as a designer, would you ever put uh, someone at risk? You see that managers, some construction managers, they ask the laborers go and do the work. They don't ask themselves whether, is, is, is it a safe place for you to do any work? Why you should put someone else's at a risk if you don't want to take that risk by yourself? That, that's the fundamental of health and safety. Everyone needs to go home safely. You have a family, everyone has a family. Why you, the labor, should not go home? That's what the, the bitter truth of health and safety, right? I would say that uh, in a uh, context, uh, the awarding contract, that is some area we have confirmed on. And you have to give marks. It has to be included in the tender stage. This is what happening in the developed countries. The marks will be low if you have the low health and safety report. Sometimes people lose projects based on the health and safety. That's why they put a lot of effort to maintain high standards. Right? I like this one, which is called the Eric. We call the Eric model called uh, eliminate, el eliminate, reduce, isolate, and control. Some instance, of course, projects that we are, you, if you see a risk, you try to eliminate. That's the first uh, stance. If not, try to reduce it. If not, you isolate it. 
if you cannot do that as well, you have to manage, control it. That, that's the basic thing. Uh, I don't want to go in details, but I know uh, there are guidelines, construction, uh, the health and safety guidelines here, management system should be put in here, and et cetera, right? Uh, in UK, like what we do, we call the health and safety risk assessment for each and every aspect. The uh, one side is probability of occurrence of that risk. On the right hand side, on the, the uh, we give a severity. The one you see in the red one is the most dangerous areas. You don't want to be because it's uh, catastrophic and uh, almost certain that it would happen. No, you don't want to do be there. So what you need to do is, if you identify an activity, you come up with a mitigation systems, try to go away from it, try to go amber and green. Each and every phases you should do. I, I, I personally think uh, that is part of the culture should uh, uh, people, you know, the perspective towards it that has to happen. And uh, in a designer's context that uh, we developed what we call the she box, uh, uh, safety, health, and environment box. Uh, if you see that very critical items, we show that into the, the drawings because contractors should be aware of there are certain uh, health and safety requirements or issues are there if you not follow the sequence. So we translate that idea to the contractor in that way, right? Oh, of course, you can use method statements, and there are a number of ways you can do. Uh, this is uh, um, a designer regulation as part of CDM, and uh, I know that uh, I don't want to get into too much here because uh, there are certain standards in Sri Lankan context, right? But emphasis is that uh, is very important. Yeah, this one uh, is one of my famous uh, pictures. I've shown this number of forums, but. You see on your left, this is what you design. On your right, what sometimes you encountered on site. You should know that this can happen, right? And as a good designer, what, what fundamentally wrong sometimes that uh, 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 what I see at a certain degree that uh, uh, young crowd coming from the universities and uh, they confine to the design offices not knowing what's outside. They should know the difficulties. Why on earth you put an employee at risk like this? Do you think about it? And don't specify 40, like if possible, because heavy. You, have you seen that you touched it? Go and have a look. How people struggle, the employees struggle to bend these ones. So you use the appropriate, right? That's the area I want to emphasize here. Okay, I talk about a lot that uh, this, uh, the process, okay? Now we come to the option selection uh, process. I like to see this happening in Sri Lanka, most of the project. We call the option matrix, matrix including key considerations. What it gives is that you identify the options, you give marks for number of areas. You have to give marks for the technical feasibility, commercial feasibility, is the risk, construction feasibility, time, right? Of course, you can't see many here, but uh, uh, yeah, this picture you'd see. Then you, you, you have a system to find out this option, suitable for that location. The decision won't be taken by independently, but it has to be uh, discussed with the stakeholders like you know, employer, contractor, everybody, right? What, that This is what I wanted to emphasize. The whole process you done, you end up with what you call the optional study, otherwise the value engineering study. It's an economical study, which gives the, the, the best option for you. Now, uh, coming back to uh, the R, R uh, project that what we talked about, and uh, we talked to the, the contractor, they done a similar thing in Kadavata interchange. They have this big uh, formwork that one of the key requirements, because they use the, uh, what do you call, full stage. Uh, they, they agreed that some of the material that can be used, 
And hence, we selected uh, the post tension box girder would be the suitable option here. But there are a number of uh, uh, considerations we took into uh, uh, took, took on board um, for commercial reasons. I can't disclose of uh, the commercial aspects, but nonetheless, that that is probably you end up with a very elegant structure like that, right? Thankfully, uh, collaboration with the contractor. Right? Uh, where are we with it? I think we completed all the design fully done, is about to construct, right? But I let me take you to the next step very quickly. Detailed design. Now, you identify everything. Now you want to do the detailed design stage. What do you do? You do the job, start the job, right? That's important. How do you start the job? Because I don't know whether you come across this, uh, uh, the document BD slash 20, uh, BD 2 slash 20, which is, uh, 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 guideline, it gives the technical approval of highway structure. I really recommend this needs to be referred in every project because it gives the uh, um, the opportunity uh, for the, the people to do the job right. Very uh, start from the uh, start start the job right. Right now, uh, <clears throat> what it, that document states is you develop what you call the AIP. This is a basis of design. You can do uh, that for any structure. Any uh, uh, it includes the all the details of the structure. It's a live document, by the way. And why I say it's a live document because as the project progresses, uh, there are things can change, and then you would uh, include that in that document. And then you need to get the approval from the the employer. Then it's set. And it's good for your claim purposes as well if you are wearing a different hat because it's been agreed. And any changes, it's uh, feed into change control and then it prompts a claim. So uh, thankfully that we implemented that for our project and there are a number of AIPs. I'm so proud of that I managed to introduce many in this uh, Central Expressway one. Uh, then that document also talks about the what you call the checking process. Depending on the structure, uh, we have certain categories, category one, two, three, as such. The complexity arises, the fact that, that you have to have uh, independent checking. For example, if the structure is so complex, then you will have to do an independent checking with a different party, right? Uh, I'm not going to get, get into detail, but category CO means self-checking. One means that you can do a, a different party within the uh, design team itself. Uh, likewise, the intensity increases, right? Now, why I want to emphasize is that, I mean, the picture about is this is uh, suspension bridge in USA, you know, in 1940. It's a Tacoma bridge, you know, it's a famous collapse of a bridge, it's actually due to resonance. And uh, uh, this picture about below right is from uh, India. I mean, I, do you want to be part of this project? Just why do you want to be part of this project now? It's a fa failure. That's why I'm saying the emphasis should be for your checking. Checking, do yourself checking, due diligence, and uh, also uh, 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 checklist needs to be prepared by the designers itself. You know, they, there are industries, for example, our company has a nuclear industry, right? Unbelievable checking. My God, I, I can't explain how many check-ins they do, right? Because the uh, catastrophe would be huge for the humankind. You can't make mistakes in that nuclear industry, can you? No. So that's why uh, there are steps needs to be followed through. So that culture should be incul inculcated in our process as well, the checking. You do a design, have you checked that? You ask yourself, okay? Anyway, so my this actually takes me to the, the last part of my presentation, uh, which I would touch base on some of the aspects that uh, the detailed design of post tension box girders, right? So, uh, yeah, I, I would say that broadly you can categorize the substructure and a superstructure. You know, it's not like a normal bridge. Of course, when you take substructure, you need to know about the soil condition. And uh, one, one of the processes actually told me when I was in uni, and forget about everything, you should know where you're sitting on. That's 
True. Because anything will be built. I mean, you know, you, you need to know what's the, the ground conditions, right? If the ground conditions are not right, and the structure will collapse due to a number of reasons, the settlements, movements, and etc. So you need to work with the geotechnical engineers very well. And then uh, uh, with that, then of course you go to superstructure. There are reports, you know, the uh, diaphragm and things like that. Let me touch base on some of the aspects in my next few slides. So modeling, when it comes to modeling of structures, uh, I think uh, the reports gives uh, good guidance. Now, if you look at uh, uh, 1992 part one, and uh, it, it gives the global analysis uh, aspects, you know, idealization structure, that some guidelines are there. Um, you can choose the appropriate one here. And when on your right hand side, you have uh, 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 line B models, relay models, and et cetera, depending on the complexity. But for this instance, we choose two. One is a line beam and a village. Line beam uh, is the one that we do primarily because it gives some idea of uh, the behavior. But then the village being developed, which gives uh, uh, the uh, torsional effects and etc. Right now, uh, the uh, we use uh, software called Midas, which is uh, I'm not promoting any software by the way, but this is what we use. But any software would do, but uh, nonetheless, that uh, Midas gives options to tackle the long-term behavior, which is good. Uh, because otherwise, uh, I mean, uh, when you look at the uh, post-tension beams, uh, continuous ones, you have secondary moments and things like that. It, it handles well, right? Uh, one aspect I want to highlight is uh, the soil structure interaction. The Because you talk to the geotechnical engineer, you work out the springs, the bearings, skin friction, and the lateral springs. You uh, add them into the model, it gives the actual behavior. And also, uh, uh, you need to look at that articulation I mentioned, where the structure should move and etc. And that also needs to be included in this model. Then only it represents the actual behavior of, uh, of the structure, what you would expect on the natural way. So uh, any software that there are areas, I would uh, broadly say properties, boundaries, loads, and then finally re review. I mean, uh, uh, not only Midas, you take any building course, ETABS or any you talk about it, you, you need to follow this, right? Because the stiffness changes, you change the parameters, behavior changes, right? I mean, if you are doing hardcore structural engineering, that's what happens. Um, yeah, this area is very interesting area of that uh, mm, uh, because I told you that we had a uh, challenge. We we won't we wouldn't be able to get that nice curve because of the height requirements. So we had a, we we had a kink. So uh, there you had to be very careful about the shear capacity. We did a trick which uh, uh, discussing with the contractor. We internally we increased the thickness as you go through. This is what you see in the picture here. And in fact, uh, I was so confident that uh, uh, we can go this one because uh, UK that uh, I had number of uh, similar type of bridges which I referred to, and this is one of them. And uh, But there's stress concentration is there. So I would urge, like if you are doing this post-tension box guard bridges, maybe uh, applicable for any as well, that if there's a sudden change, that area of concern always. Please be mindful of that area. Right? And uh, one of the key areas of a post tension box grid is a diaphragm. Diaphragm, uh, again, uh, if you look at the Euro code, it gives proper guidance. Uh, it gives the, uh, they use actually a start and tie method. Like uh, you have the support conditions in the loading and uh, uh, where you find out tension areas, you need to provide reinforcements. Like Likewise, if you have a compression strut, you need to make sure the uh, compression is not exceeding the capacity of the concrete, likewise. right? And uh, that guideline is pretty much there. Um, I mean, there are two aspects. One is with the hole, without hole, because inside people needs to go through one side to the other. And that's what you see on the right-hand side picture. Yeah. Um, the uh, another extension is uh, you can have transverse post tension as well 
because if you look at that picture on the schematic picture, if you just think of the loading, top will be under tension. You can provide transverse tension, tendons there. Again, I would say you'll be able to use strut and time method here. If proper guidance is there, please refer to the euro groups. And the uh, majority of the time, this is very highly congestion area. There's so much reinforcements, right? Uh, this is what uh, a project that I worked for uh, when I was working for Atkins. Mm. We used uh, beam modeling because we wanted to identify clashes and uh, because the amount of reinforcement is enormous. Hence, uh, we, uh, we developed this model and uh, as you see, it's very, very, very useful. And then, uh, I mean, otherwise you need to visualize when you review the uh, uh, drawings, uh, you need to think about all the areas that there's no clash. I had to spend a lot of time for this project also not to make any clashes to happen, right? Uh, <clears throat> also, uh, another key design area is that in block. In block is where the, when the do the force tensioning, at the end, you have the big anchorages. The whole force will be transferred to the, the box itself at that corner. And what eventually happens is uh, there's a lot of stress, stress concentration can happen. You know, due to poison ratio, the, it, uh, the, uh, uh, when you apply the force at that corner, it will expand. And uh, generally, it tends to burst. And uh, then you need to have right confinement. Uh, there's a guideline on Syria. I would encourage uh, those who are working. I know that many of them are not. For the code purpose, I'm saying that bursting, equilibrium, falling, you need to satisfy there. That guidance is there. But in the Europe, again, suggest you can use strut and time. That's also another option you can use. Or if it is very complex, I would uh, people tend to use this body for the solid modeling. And uh, you do uh, solid finite element modeling and check whether the stresses are comparable. Right? There are options available. Uh, the again coming back to the the uh, in block design, uh, um, I would say uh, what I want to emphasize is these geometrical clearances. You have to put a lot of effort here uh, just to make sure the jacks will fit. If the jack won't fit, it's a disaster when at the last stage. That's why that benefit of having ECI early contractor involvement, because some project give the opportunity to talk to the contractor. Contractor has the, the opportunity to talk to their preferred supplier, right? When you get the preferred supplier, then you get the product. Then you check whether that product fits here. This is what we did here. And then thankfully, 100% sure this would be fit. And I know uh, so much time we talked about it. it, it otherwise, it will not. Uh, would be a catastrophic failure. If you can remember my initial one, you know the change, uh, the cost versus uh, time change. See, if you happens at the very uh, at the latter part of the uh, the process, the rectification would be very huge. So please bear that in your mind, right? Okay. Uh, the one of the classical features, the other aspect is this in block vistas within the box itself inside, right? Their termination should be there. People can walk through, and uh, and of course, uh, the health and safety is very important because you are working on different fine areas. Uh, the less uh, air control should be checked. The um, what I want to emphasize is this: um, um, this is a, a very interesting area where the when you at actually terminate the green arrows above, which it takes the cable out. Right. Sometimes, depending on the post tension box, you have double curvatures. One a curvature going in the vertical direction and the horizontal direction. So uh, this is a very important area you have to be careful of. Otherwise, of course, we can tackle. We are engineers. We know how to tackle. We put right amount of hooks, and uh, uh, that had happened in some of the projects that uh, uh, previous when I was working. And then there's a guideline being written on that. Okay, so that sums up my uh, the design uh, uh, issues. Like uh, I have 
two more slides. I wrap up this one within very short space. I know you're conscious of the time, right? Uh, this is the future challenges, right? I would say that uh, we are moving in the, the 21st century and it's happening in the digital transformation. We have BIM and 3D visualization. My question is that uh, any organization you are work for, do you have the right uh, the, uh, documentation? If you want to uh, assess something, can you get the requirements very quickly? I, I certainly, I think you'll probably be struggling. Now, that's what we, the digitalization coming on. It's a BIM model. It's, it's the trend now in the society and the, the industry, right? It will come. It, it has to be the case. And also online monitoring system. Uh, you can use uh, latest technology such as drones, fiber optics, you know, crack identification. The one of the good example is that uh, for uh, cable stage bridges, you can look at the strain requirements offline. And uh, we use this technology for offshore structures as well. We put strain gauges, see that uh, the structure moves is dynamics, that you work out the natural frequency, right? If something uh, different, you see some, something happen to the structure likewise. And uh, uh, I, I want to emphasize this one, that uh, this is what I want to say, the third bullet point, uh, the develop early warning systems for you know, assessment modification. And uh, uh, then naturally we are moving to the new uh, materials such as carbon plus and aramid because the technology uh, improves and they, uh, there are guidance on that. Um, so please, please look into these areas, right, for future developments. Okay, um, let me wrap up this with this some of my uh, concepts now. Person, this is my personal view. I feel that uh, there are areas we we can still develop in in, in bridge sector improvement, knowing both sides of the, the spectrum. And it's not matured yet, uh, like buildings, right? There are areas you can improve. You are doing, please try to follow the procedures that I uh, emphasize here. With a, you can be wearing different hats. You can be wearing clients or contractor. And finally, if you know the process, what needed to be done, try to get it into the procurement rule. So that's what I want to emphasize. And the second one is the value engineering. We call it optionary studies. And that has to be done. That has to be done for many projects. They know you get it, the right uh, response. And uh, now uh, I also want to say the procurement strategies. See that uh, without policy, without procurement, nothing can be done, right? If you don't get the right uh, specification written, and uh, uh, you won't get the benefits, right? And it's very difficult to implement changes later if you already signed the contract. So the, there's a lot of emphasis should be before that. That's what uh, the expert knowledge should be there, right? I think uh, the last point is that uh, uh, long way to go, I think which sector will blossom here uh, and uh, we need wider support, not only from one single entity like designers, architects, and all the stakeholders should all work hard and get this through. So with that not, uh, and I conclude my presentation. I hope you enjoy, but uh, yeah. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Naduna Andlis, uh, for the presentation. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is a great pleasure to have this opportunity. It was the vote of thanks today. Uh, first of all, I must, uh, before before the vote of so thanks, we have to appreciate the presenter. And uh, we have arranged a small uh, memento to give away, and I would like to invite uh, the our chairman, uh, Engineer Kamal Bunwadun on stage. And Dr. Nadu Nabis, uh, please.
Thank you very much, Doctor and Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first presentation uh, we we conducted for the uh, new tenure of Civil Engineering Sectional Committee. And uh, if, I, if I remember, that this is the first one that we uh, did uh, when we stopped the physical presentation in March in 2020. So we did a uh, few, I did two uh, memorial orations. Uh, other than that, this is the first presentation. So today is a very special day for our CNG section committee. And uh, we must uh, really appreciate those who come uh, in physical here. And we had many uh, joining it online. And thank you very much for all. And a special thank goes to the uh, person today, uh, Dr. Nadunalis. And really appreciate and the way that you did the presentation, the holistic view, how this bridge design is done. And uh, there may be any questions, and you can uh, share this question in our WhatsApp group. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, all these presentations will be uploaded to the YouTube channel of the Swing Sectional Committee. Then uh, you can uh, see all the presentations that we did over the last year also. And uh, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, to so, so joining here. And uh, thank you, the ISL and the review executive here. And uh, we'll meet with another presentation in future. And those who are joining with the uh, monthly meeting of uh, Swing Section Committee, please uh, you can join online here onwards. And uh, we'll thank you again. Have a safe journey back. Ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, take a couple of minutes and you, do we have any questions right now? You, you can on the mic and you can ask now. The, the, the question is uh, related to actually there are two types of construction that I mentioned, this segmental and the full stage. Now, when you come to a segmental construction, of course, the uh, you need to ensure that uh, the enough post tension will be applied so that it will stick together, right? And uh, you need to apply enough such that the deflection also needs to be controlled appropriately. And, uh, and also it depends on number of strands available because there are certain, uh, certain number of, uh, I would say anchorage are available within that uh, boxes. But whereas when you consider uh, the full one, the full stage, you can have one cable uh, going from one end to the other. And uh, if the lengths are bigger, then you can have connections as well. And uh, of course, uh, the losses will be there, but uh, you need to negate and find out uh, what is the right amount of application spaces, post tension. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any questions you can uh, share with the uh, civil section committee? Uh, you have I think, our WhatsApp group. We have WhatsApp group, or so you can uh, send the email of civil section committee of the IESM. Then we can. Uh, Direct those to the uh, today the presenter, Dr. Nadunalis, and uh, they will answer accordingly. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, then we'll stop today and have a safe journey back, those who are here, and good night all. Thank you.